Hello and welcome to Beverly Baptist Church. My name is Grace and I will be leading you through this service today. Wherever you are, whatever time you're watching this, whether you're a member of BBC or you've just found us on YouTube, the good thing is that God is always with us. Now it says in Matthew, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now that's something to definitely be thankful for. So let's carry on with that thanks in a song. Thank you, Emily, for that. Even though we're an active church, there aren't many notices today, but we do have many things to be thankful for. Lockdown is easing because we have a vaccine for the virus, and because of that, children have, been, have gone back to school this week. We also got the new keys for the building this week for church, the Armstrong Centre. Also, if you have any birthdays or anniversaries, do tell Karen so that she can get in touch with the Crunchy Fairies. We have many things to be thankful for, so let's pray for them now. Lord Jesus, thank you for all the good things you give us. Birthdays and anniversaries, new buildings and opportunities, and a vaccine for the virus. But most importantly, Lord, eternal life through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Amen. Another thing to be thankful for is if you can see, I'm in the Armstrong Centre right now recording this. If you want to get some bread and wine ready after the next song, we are celebrating communion. Then Phil's going to talk to us about showing Jesus by submitting to each other. And if you're watching this on Sunday, it's Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day. As we prepare to remember Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross, we're going to sing in worship a couple of songs which remind us of God's love. We're going to start by singing God, You're So Good, which we recorded last summer, and then we're going to sing together Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean. Let's praise God together. Oh, 
winds open deep and wide Through the floodgates of God's mercy Flowed a vast and gracious tide Grace and love like mighty rivers Poured in This building has been used for a whole variety of purposes over the years, but possibly this is the first time that communion has been celebrated in this place. It's a special moment for us to mark the death of Jesus and to mark what this building is to become, a place where we worship him. Here is love, we have just sung, and here in this building is love, and here in bread and wine is love. Love made real in a body broken, in blood spilt, in a perfect life offered for imperfect people, that through his death we might live. Here indeed is love. Let us pray. Thank you, loving God, that we can celebrate communion. It seems strange to talk of celebrating a death, but it is a death that shows us the depth of your love for us, a death that lifts us out of our own deaths into life with you, that lifts us out of darkness into light, out of despair into hope. And we thank you particularly now for this opportunity to remember your death in this place that is to be our home and a place of worship and a place where your presence dwells. And as we watch in from wherever we are and share in this moment together, may we be very aware of your presence and of your love. And Lord, as we prepare to take bread and wine together, we just spend a moment now in silence to think of those things that we need to say sorry for and to offer ourselves once again back to you. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that you offer us through your grace and love. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As Grace and I take bread and wine here, I invite you to join with us. So the body of Jesus, broken for you.
and the blood of Jesus shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink with thanksgiving. Thank you once again, Lord, for these reminders of your love. As we have shared bread and wine together, may we be empowered by your spirit to live the lives to which you have called us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading today is in two parts, 1 Peter 2 verses 11 to 25 and 1 Peter 3 verses 8 to 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit yourselves, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority, or the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of the foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up 
for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, Repay evil with a blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Good morning, everybody. I had really hoped that this week's sermon could be brought to you from Armstrong's, but technical issues of a broken laptop have delayed the preparation and made that not possible. But it was a privilege to be able to join with Grace and Stephen, who was manning the camera, to record part of the service there yesterday. And we look forward to increasing the worship and the prayer that goes on in that building over the weeks to come. As we look at this passage this morning from 1 Peter 2 and 3, which we've heard read, this may be one I think that some preachers, myself included, may instinctively wish to shy away from. A passage about submission, not a comfortable subject, and made even less comfortable when we see that Peter's examples include slavery. And the bit which the astute among you will have noticed we didn't read at all, the beginning of chapter 3, about wives submitting to husbands. I've omitted that bit not because I can't explain what I think it's saying and I'll happily discuss that with anyone who wishes to, uh, but to do it justice, just that section, uh, given its controversial nature, would, would far exceed the time uh, that I have available. And I want us to be able to focus on the bigger themes that are running through this section, which I'm really looking forward to unpacking. Because actually... I don't think this passage is about submission, at least not primarily. Yes, four times in these verses, Peter says, submit, in a number of different contexts. And we'll come on to, to look at that. But many more times, I counted at least nine, he speaks of doing good 
or of leading good lives. And that, I believe, is the focus of what he's saying here. The verses which frame our passage are the key. If we just read the beginning and end of what we heard today, just listen. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. The thrust of Peter's message is how we should live a life which is a good witness to those outside the church. He's addressing the issue of what does it look like to be foreigners and exiles in the world, as we've referred to in previous weeks. What does it look like to be the royal priesthood and the holy nation, which we mentioned last week? We don't know the exact situation Peter is writing into, but as we've seen, it appears to be one in which the church is suffering. And it seems that some outside the church are seeing the church as a threat, as a subversive organisation, as one which is seeking to stand against the emperor, to overthrow societal structures. Perhaps some within the church are pushing that way too, calling for a more extreme, more rebellious approach to the way that society is ordered, to the civil authority structures. And Peter is keen that they don't take that too far. He's keen to encourage the church not to court controversy, not to seek out suffering, not to cause trouble for trouble's sake. Rather, Verse 12 of chapter 2, they are in the goodness and the purity of their lives to win over the opposition, while also remaining faithful to their calling as servants of Christ. And within that, there are some, but some subversive and countercultural elements, as we shall see. He addresses three specific contexts, of which, as I've said, we're going to consider the first two and what we can learn from them. And then by way of conclusion, we'll look briefly at his concluding remarks to the section, those verses from chapter three. So first he looks at submission to governmental authorities, verses 13 to 17. And at first reading, what he says here could be seen to be very conformist. Recognise the authorities, the emperor, the governors, do as they say. Here end any thoughts of the church as a protest movement or a subversive political force. But on closer reading, it's not quite so simple. Because it's not submission for submission's sake. We do not submit to such authorities simply because they demand it, or because the world recognises them as as an authority. We do so for the Lord's sake. Our submission is for the sake of the gospel and to bring glory to God. In other words, this is about not bringing the church, not bringing Jesus, into disrepute. It's about not giving those who are claiming that the church is out to cause trouble any ammunition to support those claims. We are to do good in the eyes of people. And the assumption here is that, in the eyes of people, the good thing to do will be to follow the recognised authorities, as is usually, but not always, the case, as we'll see. We are to do good in the eyes of people in as far as we are able, because that gives a favourable impression of the Church of Christ. But it is in as far as we are able. When we come to verse 17, we, we read... Show proper respect to everyone. Honour the emperor. Notice, honour the emperor, not obey the emperor. But we also read, love the family of believers, fear God. And so it is clear that our submission will have its limits. When to submit to the emperor or 
whatever the political powers are in our situation, when to do that would cause us to deny our faith or to compromise our Christian ethical principles, then doing good as God would define it takes precedent over doing good as the political forces would define it. And so the early church, to whom Peter is writing, took great pains on the whole to live at peace with everyone, as Paul urges them to in his writings. To be good neighbours, to love all people. But they had their lines that they would not cross. They would not pledge allegiance to Caesar. They would not say Caesar is Lord because they would say Jesus is Lord. They would not serve in the army or as a magistrate. They would not become an agent of a pagan state. And for much of the time, the authorities were happy to live with that trade-off. They weren't the only group that would have had similar qualms, the Jewish faith. As one other example, had opt-outs from various uh, rules and expectations in the Roman world. Most of the time, the Roman authorities took a pragmatic approach and lived with that. There were times, such as probably the time Peter is writing to under the Emperor Nero, where that changed and the Roman Emperor persecuted the church for their unwillingness to conform. Now we of course are in a very different situation. We have in the UK pretty much complete freedom of religious expression, protected in law, we are in a democracy, so we have much more say than Peter's hearers in who the governors and authorities are, and we can at least hope to remove those who would require us to act in ways which compromise our conscience. But even so, there will come times when we must say we are no longer willing and able to submit to the earthly authorities for the Lord's sake. The most striking and well-known example from fairly recent history is probably Germany in the 1930s. When the Nazi government of Adolf Hitler attempted to unite the Protestant churches into one organisation, under government control and with a highly anti-Jewish theology. A small number of German pastors actively supported this. The great majority kept their head down and tried to ignore it. And another small number protested about 3,000 out of the 18,000 pastors in Germany at that time. They organised themselves into what became known as the Confessing Church, that refused to accept that the state had authority over Christian doctrine and practice. They refused to submit. And history shows that they were the ones who were doing good deeds for the Lord's sake. As Christian people, we are free in Christ. We are not bound by any earthly authority. We are slaves of Christ. So we must use our freedom wisely. And Peter warns us here not to use that as a cover up for evil. We must respect our political leaders. We must submit to them in as far as we are able for the Lord's sake. But we must remember that our primary call is to fear God and to serve him. The Apostle Paul, I would suggest, puts this into action when he's arrested on suspicion of trying to cause a riot and insurrection and after a drawn out legal process which establishes that actually at heart this is an issue of a religious disagreement relating to the Jewish faith, this isn't a civil matter at all. In Acts 25, Governor Festus offers Paul the opportunity of going to Jerusalem to stand trial in a religious court before the Jewish authorities. And Paul answers, I'm now standing before Caesar's court, where I ought to be tried. I appeal to Caesar. He affirms the authority of the civil legal process and his submission to it. To give an example of what this looks like from recent events. And this is my understanding of how I would work out this passage in the example I'm going to give you. 
And I've chosen the example partly because you may not entirely agree to illustrate that these matters are a matter of conscience and sometimes we won't reach the same conclusion. But I hope it will illustrate the balance that is to be struck here. In England, we have been in lockdown since early January. For most of that time, schools were closed, along with non-essential retail and hospitality. And there have been a small number of businesses that have defied that lockdown order. One of which I saw was a Christian cafe and bookshop, which remained open despite repeated orders to close, uh, on a variety of grounds, but including that they were not bound by the law of the land because they were free people who submitted to a higher authority. I would suggest that that is a clear violation of what Peter is saying in verse 16. We cannot allow our freedom to be a cover-up for evil. The evil of the potential contributing to the spread of Covid in the middle of a, a spike. The evil of selfishly saying that we should be allowed to continue with everyday life and that earn an income while everybody else has to suffer the effects of the restrictions. And the reputational risk to the Christian community and to the name of Jesus in the eyes of society which will largely see that as an act of evil, not of good works. By contrast, in the earlier lockdown last year when churches and places of worship were forced to close, a group of church leaders began a legal challenge to the legality of this. And part of their challenge was based on a very similar argument that the right to worship was enshrined in law as a fundamental right, and so could not be suspended by government, even in such unusual circumstances. Whether or not you agree with that argument isn't the point here. I do have some sympathy with it. But the point is that on the surface, they may be making a very similar point to that Christian cafe earlier, but there's a crucial difference. Their churches remained closed while they mounted that legal challenge. They submitted to the authority of the law, while at the same time challenging it. Now, of course, churches were allowed to reopen before that legal challenge made it to judgment. And if the judgment had gone against them, some of those church leaders may have said, that is the point in my conscience where I must defy the law and open anyway, because we believe that is what doing good for the Lord's sake looks like in this situation. But their willingness to first submit to the legal processes agreed by society as a whole, the courts and the legal system of this land, is, I believe, the approach which is in accordance with what Peter is saying here. It's not that we can't ever challenge authority. It's that, and I, I emphasise, I'm speaking here about our approach in the current UK with a, a democratically elected government which can rightly claim legitimate authority even if we personally didn't vote for them. In as far as we can, we issue that challenge while still recognising that it is a legitimate authority. Until such a point as having considered what is living a good life in the eyes of God and of other people, our conscience requires us now to take a stand in opposition. And it's that point which Peter addresses in his second example, that of slaves and masters. It feels immensely foreign to us, and we need to understand something of the cultural context. I'm, I'm not going to go into in depth to how the New Testament deals with slavery. But there is evidence that one group among which early Christianity spread rapidly was slaves. Perhaps for those who, who had a limited personal freedom, a faith which promised freedom in Christ was particularly attractive. But it left some of those slaves with a dilemma. Not so much about remaining slaves, while Paul does say clearly elsewhere that if a slave can become free, they should take that opportunity. But for many of them, that wasn't an option. The big issue they faced was that in the culture of the day, the master of the house decided the religion of that house. 
for himself, for his family and for his slaves. So a slave was required to follow the household religion. And that was a problem for Christian slaves in pagan households. And Peter's response is that they should submit to their masters. But not in fear of the master, but in reverent fear of God. And so this submission works out in a particular way. Not in submission of obedience to the master and practising the pagan religion, leaving Jesus behind, but rather in doing good, that is, following the way of Jesus, and then being prepared to submit to whatever consequences that brings, whatever punishment the master sees fit to dole out for what would be seen as an act of disobedience. This is the countercultural submission to which we are called. Not the unthinking, obedient submission to whatever this world defines as authority, but the submission to whatever consequences there are from the world in response to our submission to God. And in this, says Peter, we follow the example of Christ. Jesus, who submitted himself to the earthly authorities, to the punishment and the suffering which they meted out on him because of the good that he was doing in God's name. He had a clear conscience. He committed no sin. But because he upset the status quo and he challenged their authority, the religious leaders took against him and he allowed that to happen. He submitted himself to what they were handing out, to the beatings, to the mockings, even to death. Not because he was submitting to their authority for the sake of it, but because he was submitting to the authority of God who had called him to walk that path. As he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night he was arrested, not my will, but your will be done. God's authority, God's way. God the Father who sent his Son to follow that way of suffering for doing good, so that through his death we might live. And we are called to follow his example, to do what is good and right before God, even when that might mean that we will suffer. Because it is far more commendable for us to suffer now for doing good for the sake of Christ than for us to suffer the future consequences of turning from him and doing wrong. And this works out in many, many different ways in our lives. The obvious parallel which many draw from this passage is how we are treated by our employers. And there is a lesson that we can take from this, certainly in doing what is right and ethical at work, not giving in to workplace culture when it's contrary to the way of Christ. Being willing to be thought odd by our colleagues, ostracised even, passed over for promotion perhaps, because we won't do it their way. The parallel does break down a little, as for most of us, it is ultimately easier to leave a place of work than it was for a slave to leave their master. But the principle can be applied much more widely in our lives. Wherever we know that in following a particular action we will face unjust suffering at the hands of people, we are called to submit to that injustice. Because we submit in reverent fear to God's authority and his call. none of which is easy. And so Peter, having gone on to address his third example of husbands and wives, sums up in chapter 3, verses 8 to 12, by reminding us why we are following this difficult path. And it's all about how we relate to one another. It's about loving one another. It's about compassion and humility. Above all, it's about being a good witness and a force for good in the world. The easy path is to return like for like, to repay evil with evil and insult with insult. But that path leads into a dangerous place, a downward spiral of tit for tat, 
taking us and those who are re- we are relating to further and further from God. The face of the Lord, Peter says, quoting from the Psalms, is against those who do evil. And so as we continue to do evil, we take ourselves further and further from him. We are called rather as God's people to break that cycle, to turn from evil and do good, to repay evil with blessing, to be, as we thought a couple of months ago with Abraham, to be a blessing to the world. And so we love one another. If your brother or sister hurts you, you respond by praying for them and blessing them not by seeking to justify yourself or point out their faults. But it's not just in the church community, in the wider world too. As the world hates us and causes us to suffer, so we become even more determined to live good lives. Lives of love and of blessing. Because even though we may not see it at the time, people notice. They see our good deeds. They notice the difference and ultimately, for some of them at least, as a result of our willingness to submit to them as we submit to Christ, they too will submit to him and give him glory. A few years ago, as the civil war in Syria was at its height, thousands of people fled across the border into the refugee camps of the Lebanon. Numerous aid agencies were working in those camps, among them the Baptist churches of the Lebanon, and they reported many, many Muslims taking a step towards Jesus and even coming to faith in him through their work. And the reason they identified is that this was because most of the aid agencies working out there would go to their community. The first question would be, which ethnic group are you? Which side of the conflict are you on? Which tradition of Islam do you follow? But the Christians would help anyone and everyone, irrespective of who they were. And so Muslim men and women were saying, we have been told that you are the enemy, that you are wrong in your beliefs, that you do not live in accordance with God's will. And yet we see that you love us. We see your good deeds. And we cannot help but see that God is with you. So let us go and live good lives. Let us submit to human authority for the sake of Christ, where we can do so with a clear conscience. Let us submit to the consequences of standing up for Christ when we are called to do so. And let us above all seek to live in humble love for one another as a witness to Christ and so doing to bring the blessing of God to the world. Amen. Our final song this morning is a prayer that God would work in us, that our lives might reflect him in the way we live and in our good deeds. We sing Holy Spirit, living breath of God. for your pure
abide within. May your joy be seen in all thy do. Love enough to cover every sin in each thought and deed and Thank you to all involved in the service today. Phil for preaching and for the communion, Emily for the music, and Chris for editing the video. Don't forget the Zoom coffee meeting at 11.30 for BBC regulars. And also, let's remind ourselves again of the promise that Jesus made from Matthew 28. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age.